Hello, this is the St. Christopher's Church Leicester Sermon for Sunday the 10th of May 2020. The passages are John chapter 14, 1 to 14, and Acts chapter 7, verses 55 to 60. So if you haven't yet read them, pause this video, read them, and then press play. What does trust involve? Well, it involves putting yourself in the hands of someone else, confident that they will take care of something. Black taxi drivers in London have to take an exam called the knowledge before they are allowed to be taxi drivers. And in order to pass the knowledge, they need to study and memorise the different roads and routes across the city of London so that when they pick up a passenger, they can, from memory, take that person to where they need to go. It sounds like an incredible task to me to be able to pass that exam, to be able to have so much of the huge city of London memorised that you can get someone from any one particular street to another from memory. Whatever the part of the brain is that is used for memory, my guess is that it must be massive on a typical black taxi driver's brain. And what that means is that from the moment a passenger gets into a taxi, they can simply tell the driver where they want to go and then they can completely leave the journey in the driver's hands. They don't need to worry about how they'll get there because the driver will sort it out for them the best way he or she knows how. It's like that in John 14. Jesus has told the disciples that he is going to leave them. And you can imagine something of what they might have felt. You're going to leave us? We gave up everything for you. Our life is following you, doing what you do, going where you go. How can you be leaving us? You can maybe sense the distress in that room as Jesus tells them he is going to leave. But Jesus reassures them. Verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. He tells them that he's not going away because he's given up on them. He's not just got fed up with them and is abandoning them. No, not at all. Just as Jesus has served and loved them on earth, he now goes away to serve and love them in the spiritual realm, to prepare a place for them in the Father's house. And more than that, in verse 3, he assures them that one day he will come back for them, to take them to the place he has prepared for them. Jesus will soon be physically absent but he will still be working on their behalf, although they can't see it in the way that they did whilst he was on earth. And in verse 4 he says, <clears throat> You know the way to the place where I am going. Only to have Thomas reply and say, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Thomas is sort of thinking logically here. He's thinking that in order to know how to get somewhere, you first got to know where it is you're going. But Jesus tells him, tells them to trust him, to believe in him. And he assures them that they don't need to have a roadmap or a sat-nav to get where he's going. They don't need to know those details. All they need to do is believe that he will get them there. Verse 6. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Just like the London taxi driver, they need to put themselves in his hands in order to get them to the Father and to their room in the Father's house. They can't get, their, their, they can't get themselves there, but he can. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus makes it quite clear he's the only driver who can get them or us there. There is no other way. And in our Acts reading, we see how trust in Jesus brought Stephen, another follower of Jesus, to the Father, even as he is about to be killed by a mob by being stoned to death. 
just before Stephen is dragged off by them to die, he says, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Even through a violent death, his faith in Christ will bring him safely to the Father's house. And in the middle verses of the John passage, Jesus goes on to speak of his relationship with the Father. Jesus has been trustworthy all the time the disciples have been with him, and he remains so now. But more than that, the relationship that Jesus has with the Father shows us that, of course, he is the one who can bring them to the Father, because he, he has an eternal loving access to the Father. In fact, Jesus tells us that anyone who has seen him has seen the Father. So when Philip asks to see the Father in verse 8, Jesus responds, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Now here, Jesus teaches us about the inner life of God, the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. The Bible clearly affirms that there is one God, but the Bible also clearly affirms in different passages that there are three who are God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Christians speak, therefore, of the triunity or trinity of God, God's simultaneous oneness and threeness taught across different Bible passages, and this passage is one of those passages. Somehow, in a way we can't fully get our heads round, God the Father indwells God the Son, that is Jesus even whilst Father and Son remain in some way separate, divine persons. So, notice how even just within this passage, Jesus promises to be the one to give the disciples access to the Father, verse 4. And yet at the same time, the Father himself actually indwells Jesus the Son. And so they have already seen the Father. He's right there already. Now, you might feel a bit confused by this, but it is what the Bible teaches. We might not fully grasp it, but then again, would we expect our little human brains to completely understand absolutely everything about the living God? We simply need to believe it because that is what God has revealed to us through the Bible. But there is reassurance for the disciples here as well. And for us, reassurance that Jesus has got everything in hand. They can trust him and his words to give them access to the Father, as they have been able to trust him in everything else up to that point. And they can be assured that Jesus does indeed have access to the Father, because the Father himself indwells Jesus and has in fact been doing his work through Jesus. And Jesus draws their attention to his words and to his works, that they may believe that this is true. Look at verse 11. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Like the London taxi driver, they must trust Jesus to get them to the Father and to their place in the Father's house. And they must understand that Jesus has that access to the Father because the Father indwells him and he the Father. You see, this is about trust. This is about trusting Jesus to do for us what we left, what we left to ourselves cannot do. When Thomas asked to get into the detail of how to get to the Father, questioning how they could know the way if they didn't know what the destination was, Jesus gave no details in reply. He just said, I am the way, the truth and the life. 
Knowing Jesus means knowing God. The challenge for us as Christians is to live by this sort of trust. Now, of course, Christians trust in Jesus for salvation. We just need to get into the black taxi being driven by Jesus, so to speak, and we can totally rely on him to get us to the Father and to the Father's house. We put ourselves, we put ourselves in Jesus' hands to make that happen. But what about living out our Christian lives from day to day? How much does trust play a part in that? And how happy are we not to know all the detail, but to expect Jesus to come through for us, whatever? Well, I think this is more of a challenge, because if you're like me, you want to have a roadmap for things. You want to know in advance where the Lord will lead and how he will get you there, because you like to be in control. But I think that attitude reveals to some degree a lack of trust. Think about when we pray. Do we pray for things that humanly speaking, that humanly speaking are impossible? Or do we pray for things that are achievable or we think are achievable whether God gets involved or not? Do we only pray safe prayers for things that we think will happen anyway? I mean, going into the kitchen and praying, Lord, please can I have a cheese sandwich? Well, that prayer is easy when you know you've got bread and cheese and margarine in the cupboard and you can see a clear roadmap for how getting a cheese sandwich will happen. But what about when we can't see any way for a prayer to be answered, but we pray it anyway? That's admitting that we are ignorant of the detail. We can't really see how it will happen, but we believe that God can make it happen regardless. And that's trust. George Muller was a Christian in the 19th century who set up an orphanage in the city of Bristol. He was a man of faith who I've mentioned in sermons before. And although running an orphanage cost a lot of money and resources, he never asked anyone for any money for it. Instead, he just trusted God to provide. And God did provide absolutely amazingly over many years. Even though he never asked for anything from other people, they received everything they needed and it's estimated that in his lifetime perhaps around 60 million pounds was received for the orphanage and later for more orphanages and he never asked for any of it. That is living by faith without a road map. That is trust. And George Muller said this, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. This week, we as a church have run a 24-7 prayer week, and many of you have been involved in it. And we've done it from our homes. We can't really go out during lockdown. Physically, we're limited in what we can do and who we can see. But we have been praying. And when we pray and ask God to move in different lives and in different situations, I hope we understand that what we're doing is acknowledging that we are limited in power, but he is not. And perhaps being stuck in lockdown has made that more acute for us. I hope we have prayed and will continue to pray, understanding that asking God to do something is admitting that we are completely reliant on him. And if we rely on him, if we trust him, 
We can pray without having a roadmap. Faith begins where human power ends. And I look forward to being able to trace lines between the prayers we've offered up this week, past, and the Lord having done remarkable, incredible things in the lives of others and in other situations. Towards the end of the John 14 passage, Jesus says, Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. In faith, we will do greater things? Well, that's what Jesus says. But it's in faith that we can do these greater things. In his name. These things are impossible for us. We might not have a roadmap for them. But we don't need to be concerned about that because in prayer we are handing it over to him and he is far far greater than us and if we doubt we can even ask god to give us the faith to pray the really big prayers the faith that the impossible will be made possible Trust in God, Jesus said. Trust also in me. Maybe take a moment now to think about and pray about what you've heard.